medicine and he will tell us if we do tracheostomies well, too many, too often and too fast. So welcome to Amber. Uh, thank you very much and uh, I'm very acutely aware that uh, I'm the last one to stand between you and the lunch. And it's always very difficult to speak after Mervyn, but fortunately in the last couple of years I, I had this experience, so hopefully I will be able to cope with that. Um, I don't have any financial conflict of interest to, to declare. Um, I've got a scientific interest and, and a professional interest to declare that I do like doing tracheostomies and, and I, I do like uh, the, uh, doing the, the procedure on the ICU. So um, that, is, um, that is something important for you to know. Um, I just put this slide up uh, for you that the accepted indication for a tracheostomy is to provide access for prolonged mechanical ventilation. Now, what do you think? What is prolonged mechanical ventilation? And it is, it is really difficult. And, um, and um, we have heard about uh, means and mediums and, and statistics. So I will, I will just give you a, a little bit of a, um, an advice on that. Um, this paper has been mentioned. It, um, it has got its problems, but it's still a, a very good snapshot of what we have been doing about two years ago on our, on our intensive care units. And uh, this includes my intensive care unit because we were providing uh, the data. We knew when the study was going to be, and we knew that we were looking to ventilate these patients with uh, 6 mL per, per kg. And we did not, unfortunately, um, based, on, based on our, our own data. But have a look at the, the results. So the duration of invasive mechanical ventilation was 8 days, and the interquartile range is uh, from 4 to 16. So that means about 25% of the patients in this study were ventilated for more than 16 days. And that is the time frame which I would probably say that that, that is prolonged mechanical ventilation. Even if you, if you take the median, so 50% of the patients were ventilated for more than 8 days, that's where, at least on, on my unit, we are starting to think about doing tracheostomy. So what happened uh, in this study? Actually, uh, only 13% of the patients uh, received uh, a tracheostomy. So there is, uh, uh, there is a, a big difference in this study compared to the previous ones, which showed that uh, up to 30 or 40 percent of the patients on the ICUs uh, will have a tracheostomy inserted uh, during their uh, ICU stay. Are there any secular trends? And this is a very recent paper um, published uh, by uh, U.S. authors uh, who analyzed a huge U.S. data set and uh, they looked at, at how the tracheostomy rates uh, were changing uh, between 1993 and 2012. And what you can see that tracheostomy rates uh, increased until about 2008 and then they showed a, a very slow decline um, and that even um, true if you are looking at the surgeons and uh, clearly the surgeons they love to do the tracheostomies in, in the US uh, they are the ones who, are, uh, who have got the knife and the, uh, and the operating room so they have been doing a lot more but even they, they started to do a little bit less tracheostomies in, um, um, after 2008. So why, why is that, that happening? And, and um, I don't know in, uh, in Germany how, how it is in your institution, but we did have a look at uh, our own small ICU and then we, we, we have seen the same. So um, before 2008, um, that was before I, I arrived, the tracheostomy rates were, were very high. Um, and then um, I settled down in until 2010 and I have said I love doing tracheostomy, so I was doing a lot of tracheostomy during that time. And then it started to go down. And uh, by 2014, we only did uh, tracheostomies on 7% or 7.5% of the patients who, who had mechanical ventilation on, on our ICU. Um, I've got some data from the UK because uh, um, we've got this uh, quite good uh, mechanism to look into our, our debts and uh, to look into our processes. Um, and this was published very recently, the, the tracheostomy uh, C-pod, MC-pod uh, review, which looked at patients uh, on the ICU who had tracheostomy, not just 
how it was inserted, who inserted them, but what happened with these patients uh, afterwards. Um, and it's, it is free to download, and, and I, I do encourage you to read it because it's a very interesting uh, paper when you get into the meat of it. So there are about 35,000 ventilated patients to, um, in the UK ICUs, and about 10,000 of the, those will, will have a tracheostomy. So in general, in the UK, about a third of the patients will, will have a, a tracheostomy. And this is just a, a flow diagram of how, how they um, evaluated the, the care and, and uh, how they, they looked at um, how the, the tracheostomy is uh, treated uh, in the hospital. When you look at what were the indications, um, I think it's, um, it's not a... It's, it's very important to say that most of the patients, uh, the indication which was, the, uh, which was noted in the clinical notes was to facilitate weaning from the mechanical ventilation. Now, that's a very bullish statement, and, uh, and because it's a very bullish statement, we, we clinicians like to use it because we think that it's in the patient's best interest. Um, also, we, we did tracheostomies to try to remove pulmonary secretions and to, to protect the airway as the patient was at high risk of aspiration. And then there were obviously other, um, other indications as well, but most of it was to, that we tried to facilitate weaning from the mechanical ventilation. Is tracheostomy the best way to do that? Oh, well, let's, let's have a look. So, it has got a really nice graph, and it, it gives you the percentage of patients who had tracheostomy by time. And uh, when I looked at it, I thought that, oh, that's, that's not too bad, because we, we, we are doing tracheostomies quite late. But then the, the devil is in the detail, and when you look closely, um, sorry, when you look closely, this is between day zero and, uh, and day 20. And when you look at the, the number of patients uh, who had tracheostomy before uh, day 14, almost 80% almost of the patients who were ventilated on the ICU, they received the tracheostomy before uh, day 14. Um, and half of them, or almost half of them, uh, they had their tracheostomies um, before day, day 7. Um, is that a good thing? I don't really know. Um, we again had a look at uh, our, our own data and we have seen that uh, as the years increased that we, we were doing the tracheostomies a little bit later and for me, more importantly, the time to, from a tracheostomy to go to a trachea mask, so weaning the patient, that has increased. That shows that we probably got better in our, in our patient selection a little bit. Um, there is clearly variation in practice. And um, I've got some US data to, to show, um, as well as, um, as some, some German data uh, to show, because you can see that uh, the, the tracheostomy rates are very, very different if you are on a, a surgical ICU in the US or if you are on a medical ICU in the US. Again, that was, uh, that was shown in the, um, in the previous paper that I mentioned, that the, the surgeons clearly have the knife and they, they clearly like to do the, um, the, the tracheostomies earlier. In Germany, uh, there is some, uh, some data which shows that 21%, 22% of those uh, patients will have tracheas before day seven. Um, and then again, similarly to the UK, a high percentage of your patients will uh, have uh, tracheostomy before day 14 uh, of uh, mechanical ventilation if they are in the hospital. Again, just to, to highlight the variation, the huge variation in, in practice, these are the confidence intervals, and, and then you can see that the, er, the risk adjusted early tracheostomy rate varies really, really significantly. Um, and, um, and this is not good, and uh, this, is, this is not really supported by evidence, because the evidence um, shows that uh, there is no mortality benefit um, from the early tracheostomies compared to the late tracheostomies. Um, this is, was just one of the meta-analyses, this is what we have done a couple of years ago, and since then I just looked on Medline and, uh, and there, there have been at least other 10 groups who were robbing the grave of the same researchers that we were robbing in, in our meta-analysis. And they came to very similar conclusions that uh, 
the evidence is not there that it, it actually helps uh, survival uh, to do early tracheostomies. Um, what we found is that um, if you look at the, um, um, the sedation and if you look at the, the length of, of uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, then there, there was a significant difference um, and that favored the early tracheostomy. But my question is that, do we really need to do a quite invasive, fun, in a, in a way, procedure to, uh, to achieve these? Um, so how, can, how else can you achieve that? And this is not rocket science, this has been published almost 10 years ago. Um, you just wake the patient up, you get them on a spontaneous breathing trial, and then you've got the same reduction in length of mechanical ventilation and in, uh, in sedation use, then you've got it with, uh, with a quite invasive procedure. So this is the, the Lancet paper which uh, I'm sure everybody is, has got in their guideline and I'm not sure how many of you are using it on the, on the ICU. I still have a daily battle with, uh, uh, with my nurses and with my colleagues to, to implement these simple steps. Take the patient up, reduce the sedation, it saves money, it saves lives, it saves, it saves the tracheostomy, it saves the surgical procedure. Um, now, can you do it? Um, again, in our relatively small intensive care unit, we could do it. We simply changed the sedation protocol, and with that, we, we managed to reduce the length of the mechanical ventilation uh, significantly uh, from six and, a, six and a half days to, to about uh, five days. And we didn't do anything else. We just woke the patients up and we put a little bit more emphasis on, uh, on weaning them from the ventilator with the endotracheal tube. So let's go back to this slide where, you know, 14, <coughs> before uh, day 14 of mechanical ventilation, you've got about 75% of the patients having a, a, a tracheostomy. It's, it's clearly, I don't think it, it's not good. So what's happening? With those patients in the NCPOD report, 18%, so um, one-fifth of them were decannulated before day seven. So they had a, they had a tracheostomy early and they, they got decannulated. Is that a really good medicine? Is it, is it patient-centered? I don't think so. And really importantly, two-thirds of these patients, they never had a chance to come off the ventilator um, with, a, with, a, with an endotracheal tube. We never woke them up, we, we never let them breathe, and we just said that they are failed to be without trying, and then they, they have a tracheostomy. So I think that, that, uh, that indicates that we don't do what we preach. What are the outcomes, you ask? Well, if you, if you look at this, um, uh, this paper, when, uh, when you look at the, the outcomes of patients receiving tracheostomy in the, in the US, uh, the discharge status and, uh, and the, the, the rate of death came down significantly. So you can say that, oh, that's a, that's a really good news because, uh, because we are doing a little bit more tracheostomies and that, uh, that translates into better mortality. But this is just mortality in the hospital. And in the US, 80% uh, of these patients are transferred out from the acute hospital. So their hospital mortality is low and they are transferred out to the long-term uh, acute care facilities uh, where they stay for about a year. And when you look at the one-year outcome of patients who are ventilated um, for more than 14 days, uh, and again, a, a recent uh, paper in, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine says that only 13%, 1-3% of them makes it home alive after one year. So, uh, I, and, um, and from this data set, you can, you can also see that uh, the, the rate of the patients who went home and had some sort of uh, an independent life went actually down and definitely didn't change. So, percutaneous tracheostomy on the ICU, I love it. I, I still love it. Um, is it necessary? I doubt that it is necessary in a, in a large number of cases and we should really just focus on what we have already learned from the, from the big studies and we should do what we preach and don't just preach it. Um, what, we, what we do is, uh, in the UK at least, we perform about 
30% uh, uh, of the patients will have a tracheostomy, and we do it without uh, performing uh, an attempt to extubate them. Um, we do a lot of the tracheostomies within seven days of admission, and I, I, I simply don't understand that why we are doing that. Um, and then we decannulate 20% of them within within seven days. So it's it's it, it is um, an oxymoron and a clearly waste of time. What we don't do, we don't predict well the length of the mechanical ventilation. And uh, the Trackman study, uh, which is the, the biggest randomized control trial on on, uh, on the timing of the tracheostomy, um, it was a negative trial again. But the most important message from that was that. Clinicians, senior ICU clinicians were completely and utterly unable to predict that how long the patients will need mechanical ventilation. That is the, that is the main message from, uh, from, from that study. Um, and what we don't do is that we don't make an MDT decision on the procedure. It's the, it's the clinicians and the ICU doctors who are deciding when to do a tracheostomy and we are really bad at involving other healthcare professionals especially the nurses, the physios, and, uh, and the speech and language therapists who are maybe, I, I should say, that they are in more, more intimate and much more involved uh, um, in the patient care than, than the ICU you know, physicians. Um, in the UK, sadly, we don't take consent uh, for the, the procedure. And I think if you are doing a surgical procedure, uh, even if you are on the ICU and you are needing an emergency laparotomy, then at least we need to inform the relatives, and we only do it in about half uh, half of the cases. Although that has uh, that has improved uh, in the in the last couple of years, we we don't use any kind of checklist um, for the tracheostomies. In the in the um, NCBOT report, only 16% uh, of the tracheostomies were done with any form of checklist. Um, and you might not be a big fan of a checklist, and the checklist can be really bad if they are designed badly. But if, it, if they are designed well and they are, they are uh, doing what they, are, what they need to do to prevent you from doing harm, uh, then they can be very useful tools uh, to reduce the morbidities of, of this procedure. And I don't know what is, what is happening in, in Germany, but uh, we teach all our anesthetic trainees that the, uh, the final verification of a placement of, a, of an endotracheal device is to use capnography. What are we doing on the ICUs? We don't use capnography, only in 50% of the cases. So again, we, we don't do what we preach, and only if we do, just do what we preach, we would improve outcomes. Um, and as a result, I believe that we perform at least 40% of the ICU tracheostomies completely unnecessarily. We cause an excess morbidity uh, in about 20% of them. We risk the loss of the airway in 6% of the cases. Um, and uh, there is a, a very nice um, review of the literature about the fatalities uh, following tracheostomies uh, published recently from Germany. And that is, that is uh, a very significant risk which is completely almost completely avoidable, um, and we still fail to manage any kind of patient-centered outcomes in a, in a positive way. So uh, if I can give you one final message um, on, um, on tracheostomies is that I do like percutaneous tracheostomy. I do like it when it's discussed on, on, uh, on our MDT meeting. I do like it when it is inserted at after 10 to 14 days of mechanical ventilation, and at least we gave one chance for the patient to, to get off the ventilator, and a good chance. Um, if it is done in a safe environment, so we've got the, the operators uh, ready, we've got the correct equipment, we've got checklist, and we've got teamwork. And if it can be managed safely on the critical care and on the normal ward, because when we increase the rate of the tracheostomies uh, on the ICU, we made a rod for our own back and we were unable to discharge our patients with the tracheostomy to a normal ward as there was nobody on the normal uh, surgical or medical ward to, to look after them. So that is uh, uh, quite critical. So what I would like you to do is to slow down, okay, doing the tracheostomies, but now it is time to run 
because there is much coming. Thank you.